Well, I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to present you my research that I'm that I've started doing it uh, with collabor your collaboration with the, the disorders of conscious data that uh, you uh, provided me and I'm very thankful for this. So I will start describing uh, what I do, my field through the research in our lab and uh, what are the research aims and feel free to ask any questions that you have due to interrupt me and ask any questions that you have during the presentation. All right, so I'm coming from the Computational Psychiatry Lab, which is located in the Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheva in Israel. Uh, Dr. Oren Shriki is the head of our lab, and uh, we mostly computational lab, but we uh, like to address different questions of uh, psychiatric diseases, of epilepsy, uh, disorders of consciousness, sleep deprivation, and others. Uh, we address these questions with critical brain dynamics, which is a theory I will discuss in a minute. Uh, computational models of brain activity, uh, which is my uh, favorite uh, research topic, and of course I will talk about it. And of course, machine learning techniques that we cannot uh, do anything without them today, and we're going to talk about the platform we developed here. Uh, of course, we do other stuff like um, brain computer interfaces and uh, stuff more related to psychology, but uh, I will leave them out uh, during this talk. Uh, all right, so what are the aims uh, of my research? Uh, so I would like to investigate correlations between disorders of consciousness uh, and metrics from uh, critical brain dynamics and from neurofield theory. Uh, these are two different theories uh, that I will explain about them later a bit. Uh, I would like to use a machine learning platform we call Homer. We developed in our lab to, discri to discriminate among disorders of consciousness states uh, based on resting state EEG. Uh, and I would like to use uh, disorders of consciousness data to validate uh, the uh, neurofield theory capabilities to model criticality and other features that I'm interested in, even complexity, and to see if I can model these features uh, the same way they appear in the experimental data. So critical brain dynamics, what we call critical criticality. Uh, so we're talking about the theory from uh, complex uh, systems in physics and uh, all different kinds of complex systems can be um, I don't know, earth science, uh, plants, and whatever you can think about. Um, and we like to apply them to neuroscience. So the main statement uh, of criticality is this, uh, the cortical networks, they operate in the near critical state, and it's balanced between vanishing, uh, slowing down activity, and exploding activity. I'm not talking about vanishing activity, I'm talking about uh, comatose states, I'm talking about deep sleep. Talking about when an exploding activity is something like the epi an epileptic seizure. Uh, and uh, it's expressed in, uh, in different scales by special temporal activity patterns called neural neuronal avalanches, which are activity cascades uh, that they can propagate from one brain region to another. If we talk about uh, EEG scale, and they can, and they Propagate in a, in a similar way between one neuron to another. If we talk about uh, some uh, uh, neural neural cells culture, this is actually where they they were found at the beginning. Just neural cell culture, and there was and they saw there are some activity patterns that propagate uh, through uh, through these neurons. And they have a power law distribution, which is very important. It's it's. It works on all different special scales, and I will uh, talk about it in a minute. All right. So, uh, what? How do? How do I define neuronal avalanches? Um, if I take an, a single channel of from an from an EEG, and I discretize it by I can discretize it by doing uh, some kind of a z-score and taking all the dots. Uh, all the excursions from, let's say, three standard deviation of uh, this AG channel. Uh, and I will say these are, these are the activity peaks. They are similar to uh, neuron firing peaks in, uh, in cell culture network. Uh, so what I do then, I, uh, I divide them to time beams and 
the time beam can be of different lengths tau and um, there you, we can you can we can use we can use tau for further calculations we can see you, you can look at tau to see different kind of uh, measurements but let's say let's say we look now at uh, this uh, top plot here so you can see that there are uh, beans and each bean represents an event even if it, not, it doesn't matter how many how many red points are inside a bean each bean is an event um, and this this actually this what happens for a single electron and when we talk about an electron array we can uh, draw it all as some raster plot so on the x axis is the time and on the y axis are different electrodes i think it's 64 electrodes here what you can see here and avalanche is defined as something um, an activity that starts on a certain electrode and then it uh, goes it propagates to other electrodes and then it and then there and then it sees uh, there is no activity anymore so for example this is a neural avalanche here and this is another neural avalanche here. So, and each avalanche, uh, there, each black dot is a time beam, basically. It's time in that, in that there is a, at least one red dot inside it. And if you want, and we want to define an avalanche size as the sum of all the black, of all the black dots in an avalanche. Um, is it clear? Do you have any questions so far? All right, I will proceed then. Uh, so yeah, we already talked about this. Uh, so there are there are some interesting uh, metrics that we can take out of this avalanche analysis. The first one will be um, neural gain, uh, which is probably somehow uh, similar to the COVID-19 contamination factor, which I mean, how many events uh, each each event will start in the future. So, for example, if sigma equals one, each event each event uh, um, uh, makes uh, cause and not just one event. If sigma equals less than one, so activity goes down, and each that means that each event causes less than one event. And for an exponential blow up. Uh, something you don't want to happen in during COVID, for example, or during nuclear chain reaction, uh, it will be a blow up and a sigma is greater than one. And it's something that happens in during epileptic and epileptic seizure. Uh, so this is the gain parameter and uh, the size distribution, uh, which is when I'm talking about size rate right before the text, I, uh, I define it as the number, the total, the number of events in each avalanche. So if we uh, compute a distribution, but let's say let's say we take uh, an EEG recording of five minutes, we extract <coughs> all the avalanches from this recording, and then we uh, uh, we will find a distribution of the their sizes. Uh, it obeys a power law. Uh, what means a power law? If you if we uh, put a, this distribution on a logarithmic scale, then uh, it will, you will get uh, a linear function, and this is this slope. And from experiments, it was found that uh, the slope is uh, minus three point uh, minus uh, one point five uh, three halves, which is this which is uh, this exponent here. So uh, these are the two main metrics that we usually extract from neuronal avalanches. Uh, the sigma, which is the branching factor, uh, uh, the branching <coughs> parameter, and uh, the slope, uh, which is the <coughs> sorry, which relates to this to the distributions or to distribution dysfunction. So how all all this related? Uh, to uh, disorders of consciousness, uh, I will show you in a minute. I would like just to mention that this is uh, not the first time that we use the, we are, we're trying to apply this theory on disorders of consciousness. Uh, this is something that was done by a uh, postdoc in our lab, Dr. Fekete, uh, who compute different measures of uh, alpha and sigma and uh, at different time scales tau and uh, try to put them on some linear graph and 
discriminate and compute this slope to discriminate between dog states, and he did it successfully. And there were also some other trials. Uh, and I would like to apply, I would like to also to start from uh, something basic, just computing alpha and sigma, and I will show you in a second uh, how I did it. Uh, another interesting thing about avalanches are the families. So here is actually, you can see very good different avalanches. So, so this is an avalanche, and this is an avalanche, and this is an avalanche. And uh, you can divide them to uh, different families. This, all these avalanches here, they belong to the same family. And in my master thesis, I use these families to discriminate between uh, mental for between words of mental imagery, and uh, it worked quite well, I must say. So they are also informative. That's that's another thing you can tell about avalanches. All right. So now I will present you some of your data. Uh, I think you are familiar with uh, these patients, at least with the, these file names. Uh, so this is a healthy patient, and uh, I computed alpha and sigma for them, and they are uh, perfectly matched and ex surprisingly perfectly matched expectation because I got one alpha equals 1.5 and sigma equals one. Uh, for this locked in syn locked in syndrome patient, uh, the alpha was a bit higher. And the sigma was lower, which is we, we, we can expect them depends on on how deep he was. Uh, what really happened with him? Because it was maybe he was he was in a locked in, but he was asleep. Because usually the theory says that if it's a locked in state, that it should be at least somehow similar to a healthy patient. Uh, and uh, here are two patients from minimally consciousness state and uh, emerges from minimally conscious state. And you can definitely can see a trend here and this in this alpha and sigma values. So the sigma values are getting lower and lower, and uh, the alpha values are getting high, are getting higher and higher. That means the slope is steeper. Uh, let's say that means we can we definitely can use these features for to discriminate between uh, disorders of consciousness. All right, enough with clinicality. Let's talk about modeling the neural field theory that maybe some of you are familiar with because uh, one year ago um, a researcher from uh, Australia, I think, uh, named Azadadze, he used uh, these data sets to, uh, and to fit it to neural field theory model. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, what is this model? Um, basically, it's a very physiological model because it models both cortic uh, cortical areas and uh, thalamic areas. And he, it, this model has some connections. Part of them are inhib inhibitory, this round connection, and the arrow are the exc excitatory connections. And it presents, it generates activity on a cortical sheet of a two-dimensional two cortical sheet. It actually uh, generates uh, spatial te uh, temporal dynamics, which are quite similar, quite similar to EG. And that is why it's interesting to feed this model uh, to EG to extract uh, different uh, parameters of the model. Uh, it models pretty well uh, different states, both ERP and both steady states, uh, sleep, epilepsy, anything else. Uh, many different interesting properties, uh, such as synaptic strengths, axonal ranges, uh, synaptic time constants, and uh, of course the glue, the gains, the excitatory and inhibitory gains. And what is beautiful and very, very uh, convenient computationally, it has an analytical power spectrum, which means if we can, for a steady state, uh, we can fit very, in a very easy way, a power spectrum uh, from an electrode of an EEG electrode uh, to the model and achieve quite, quite good results. Uh, and I will present it in a minute. Uh, so here are examples of time series uh, generated by the model. Uh, so, as you can see, it can easily generate uh, eyes open, eyes closed, uh, different sleep stages. Uh, 
Uh, all right, and before I will present uh, the results uh, of fitting to um, of fitting doc uh, doc data to this model, I would like to tell you about some abilities that uh, I developed in the last year in uh, our lab. So I developed a model fitting toolbox, uh, which is good for fitting EG data to ex uh, simulated EG data to experimental EG data. Uh, it supports multiple electrodes. You can fit time series. You can fit power spectra. And it supports uh, different models. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the Janssen Reed model. Uh, some of you may be Koromoto and the Wilson Cohen. Oh, really, really a lot of models that you can simulate here. Um, you can use different object objective functions. You can fit on uh, power spectra. You can fit on some avalanche probabilities, complexity measurements. Uh, I don't know, even IAT measurements if you want to. Um, Time series, obviously. Uh, we use different optimization methods. Uh, some of them uh, I implement by myself. Uh, some gradient descent methods, for example. There are Bayesian methods that I used some toolboxes to uh, uh, to integrate them. Uh, genetic algorithms and uh, so on. Um, all right, and some results which I'm really proud of. Uh, these are fitting results of the power spectrum at, uh, of these four patients that I presented before. So uh, the orange line is the actual power, is the power spectrum I computed uh, from the patient. And the blue line is the simulated AG. And you can see you, you got here a pretty, pretty good fit. Uh, on, on the right side, you can see the parameters of the model that produced this fit. And uh, same here. Well, maybe for maybe for the minimal minimal conscious state, the fit is not perfect. Uh, but you know, um, not, nothing is perfect in fitting. And but I, in my in my point of view, it looks pretty good. Uh, however, uh, um, if when I compare it to uh, as a does it uh, work. Uh, that uh, was done one year ago together with Peter Robinson, uh, the creator of this model. Um, I get quite diff uh, the values I get are in a quite different range uh, compared to the expected uh, the values that he get. Uh, and I'm still trying to understand why. Uh, maybe it's just not enough patience. Maybe uh, I didn't encounter for. For example, EMG activity, what he does there, um, or perhaps, perhaps I just uh, con we just converge a different local minima because we use, we use different optimization methods or just took different sections. Um, however, it still need to discover. Uh, all right, before I go to machine learning, uh, are there any questions so far? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe just a super quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen any difference between MCS plus and MCS minus in your in your fitting? In uh, the power spectra? I, did, I didn't try it. I have only uh, I have an emergence from uh, MCS and MCS plus. I didn't look at MCS minus yet. I okay. I just took four patients because. Uh, um, that was I had I, I had time only to do this. I don't have any statistics yet, and I hope I get some later. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, so Homer, uh, which stands for uh, hyperparameter optimization for machine learning using experiment-driven reservoir. Uh, so this. Um, so this machine learning platform uh, was the valid of the for a former student in our lab. And um, its main aim is to try different uh, classification techniques on uh, do different neuronal data, new different neuronal recordings, uh, not only, but this was the aim of this platform and to provide interpretability. Um, so this is an example. There are some, here are some examples of machine learning technique that are implemented um, in this uh, platform. Uh, 
what's it's one of uh, one of the features of this platform is Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. And um, what I mean by hyperparameter are different parameters in each and one of these algorithms uh, that that are not fitted. I mean, for example, if you talk about uh, neural nets, is the number of layers in a neural net. Um, there's the er some uh, error criterions in SVM, or even the algorithm itself. For example, if I get uh, better results with random forest, uh, then uh, it random the, the fact that I'm using random forest is the hyperparameter of the optimization. So what it does, it runs all the algorithms together and just gets you the best classification results, a result uh, for the best possible classification result based on all these algorithms. Um, and uh, some other advantage of this system is the interpretability. Uh, so you can use, uh, you can usually, when you talk about machine learning, it's usually black box, you just uh, put some data inside, you use some uh, supervised learning, and you get classifications and you're happy with it, but you don't know what's happened inside, which feature uh, which feature um, is more relevant, which feature is uh, have be uh, more weight, more variability. And uh, here we actually provide a very, a very um, user friendly graphical interface. Uh, to look at different comp uh, different uh, components of each algorithm and see how it contributes, uh, how each feature contributes uh, to the classification. Uh, so uh, my plan is to use this platform uh, to for discrimination of dog states, and uh, I will use features from criticality such as alpha and sigma. I will use uh, neural field theory parameters. Usually, we talk about gain parameters. Uh, spectral slope and complexity, I'll talk about, talk about them in a bit, and more uh, conventional features such as band power or connectivity. All right, so spectral slope. Uh, so maybe some of you are familiar with this plot, which is done uh, using data from your lab uh, on different anesthetic drugs. And uh, when I'm talking about spectral slope, I'm talking about, again about logarithmic scale. Uh, about spectra, that is uh, when when you present a spectrum on logarithmic scale, you can try to uh, fit some linear function to the spectrum itself, uh, usually to the higher frequencies. For example, here or here after after ten hertz. Uh, and we are interested we are interested in this beta, uh, which is uh, the slope itself in the logarithmic scale. And why we're interested in this slope? Because uh, previous research showed that it's related to excitation inhibition balance uh, that exists in in the brain or in every uh, cortical system, and it's also related to this uh, near critical state that I, pre that I presented before, uh, which means that excitation inhibition balance same as the system that points between vanishing and exploding activity. And it also can be loaded, uh, modeled in uh, neural using neural field theory, as you've seen before. Uh, the power spectra, if I want, once I feed the power spectra, I also feed the power slope, and uh, you can look at different gains and try to uh, give some meanings to this gains and to uh, to this slope and to excitation to <coughs> excitatory and uh, inhibitory gains. And uh, here are some examples that I did uh, with uh, your data. Um, there are some success there. The fit, the fitting wasn't that uh, difficult. However, uh, I didn't see any trend in this data. I expected, I mean, from this data, uh, you expect that the steeper the slope, the lower the consciousness level. You can see it here. I mean, you can see it a little bit here. Well, not sure. Maybe at the lower frequencies. Um, ketamine is unique. Um, but here I, I got, I don't see, I did, I didn't find any trend, any relation between the slope and, um, and the consciousness level. But I mean, this is just, uh, 
uh, it's just single subject, so probably I need to get more to uh, run it in more subject to get more reliable statistics. Uh, complexity, you, I guess you're all familiar with PCI, with uh, uh, TMS stimulation and uh, the complexity that you compute after TMS. Uh, however, here I would like to apply just complexity compute, uh, computation on uh, resting state EG. And I know it's possible because there are many different uh, many different uh, researchers uh, researchers that uh, tried this before and got some good results. And uh, even in our lab, Doctor Doctor Fakete uh, also tried and got some good results. So I can also I would like also to use it as a feature. Uh, to uh, pro to provide it to machine learning to the machine learning platform for discrimination between consciousness states, this sort of functions. All right, so our last uh, topic in my presentation, uh, which is more related to neural field theory rather than to disorders consciousness, but nevertheless, I will definitely use. Uh, I, I will base on the sort of conscious data to prove it. So I'd like to validate the capability of uh, neural field theory to model criticality, to model spectral slope, to model complexity, and more and other metrics. And this way, I will validate uh, both the neural the model, the neural field theory model, and all all other measures, all other metrics uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, so, how I will do it, I will uh, fit the power spectrum the way I showed before, for example, to one of to one of the disorders of consciousness patients. I will use the, uh, the model parameters to generate time series, and then I will compute uh, the metrics that I'm interested in uh, on this time series and compare them to the experimental one. I will try to Extract avalanches. I would like to uh, to compute uh, alpha and sigma. I would like to compute spectral slope beta. Uh, try to compute complexity, uh, maybe even collectivity. Um, depends how much time and uh, uh, strength I have left after all this. Uh, and I think that once I compare and I validate it, if I get similar metrics, it will give us more holistic view on the relationship. Uh, between uh, between disorders of consciousness, between critical brain dynamics, and of course uh, the model itself. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to ask questions.